Hey, good morning, everybody. My name's Stephen. I'm the senior pastor here at Cokesbury. And if this is your first time joining us for worship, I'm really glad that you guys are here. We've got a chat available to you. We would love to connect with you. So I wanna encourage you to just jump right on in there and have some fun with us this morning. We're in this series called Cabin Fever. And we began last week by talking about a guy named Paul. He's in jail and he was going stir crazy. Now the origin of that phrase involves people being in prison, right? Like people who face solitary confinement can sometimes be thought to go mentally ill. And centuries ago, back in England, they thought that a person went crazy because they were in the stir. Stir was slang for prison. So when we talk about feeling stir crazy, what we're saying is, I feel confined and it's, it's really starting to weigh on me, right? Like it's getting to me, to the core of who I am. And I think on some level, we're all kind of feeling that. Like all of us to some degree, we wrestle with this issue of cabin fever. It's been 10 months and we're looking at many more months to go. And so the question is, what do you do with that? Like, how do you navigate that reality? Well, Paul says that the cure for that is joy. He saw his environment, his circumstances, not as just pure oppression, but he actually saw it as an opportunity. In other words, if you're in Christ, you can always find a silver lining. It may take effort, it may take a great deal of patience, and frankly, it may take a lot of diligence. But Paul, we learned last week, he's like, look, I'm in jail, and because I'm in jail, I got to share the gospel with a soldier, and that soldier got saved, And if I hadn't gotten sent in here, he would have not gotten saved. And we saw in the text that we read that it just went from one person to the next to the next, even reaching up to Caesar, the then most powerful person on the planet, to his household. And here's the deal. The same is true for us. I would argue that all of us, if we actually look for it, we can find something as a result of this situation that we have discovered really is possible. I think about the number of us who found that we now have more time with our spouse or our kids or our friends than we've ever had before. Some of us have discovered that maybe what we do for a living is not quite as important as we thought it was and it's no longer the driver for our schedule and our time that it used to be. Some of us have started exercising more. Some of us have changed our sleep patterns. We've reached out in ways that we never had thought of before. And some of us have even been forced to reflect on what is it in our life that actually matters. See, what I'm trying to say is this, that something good really can come from what seems like a tough circumstance. Today, we're gonna be in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. And what Habakkuk is gonna do is just sort of say to us, okay, Paul, I see you. You see good coming out of this bad situation, but what about when I can't find anything good? So like, what do you do when you're going through something that's tough or something that's hard or something that feels like it's insurmountable and you're not seeing anything good come from it? Well, it's in that situation that you and I are called to hold on with all you got. If you've got a Bible with you, if you want to open up another browser, we're going to be in Habakkuk. It's an Old Testament book, Habakkuk 3, beginning in verse 17. Habakkuk 3, verse 17. Here's what he writes. Though the fig trees do not bud and there's no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer, and he enables me to tread on the heights. I've been thinking a lot lately. There are three great fears in my life, and all three of those fears are somewhat irrational. Like, I can own that right up front. But they are fears nonetheless. One comes from my childhood. I have a real, honest, gut-level fear of clowns. I think they're evil, I don't think they're right. You can never tell what expression they're really feeling, so I don't like clowns. I also don't like snakes. Snakes are slithery, they're ugly, they are aggressive, and I think they're one of the great evils of the world. And then the third fear that I face, I talk about a lot, is the fear of flying. Like, I don't like flying. It doesn't make sense that you would get on an airplane from a place called a terminal, right? So I don't, I don't like to do that. 
Well, throughout this pandemic, I've watched a lot of videos and I came across a guy named Chris Gertsky. And uh, he and his wife were going on vacation and so he's kind of got an adventurous spirit. And so they had an opportunity. He made the decision that he was going to try hang gliding. He'd never done it before. And he thought, this is a great opportunity to do that. So I'm just going to kind of grip it and rip it, right? Well, things didn't exactly turn out the way he thought he would. Here is a picture of him right before takeoff. And if you see that little circle right there, it's already too late. But that little circle represents the fact that he was not actually attached to his instructor. And when I first saw that, my first gut level reaction was, I may black out on his behalf. Well, it's already too late, and so they launch off. And then here in this picture, you can see the result of that. He's literally hanging on for dear life. Now, this whole adventure only lasted about two and a half minutes. And you may think, well, that's not a big deal. I could hold on for two and a half minutes. Well, let me challenge you to go hold on to a pull-up bar for two and a half minutes and just sort of hang there, and let's see what happens. Eventually, they did very quickly make it down to an area where he was able to drop. He ended up with some minor injuries, and he survived the whole thing. And I'll be honest with you, it is incredible to me that this guy did not die. It's incredible to me that he was able to hold on and didn't fall. A little while after that whole adventure was over, somebody asked him, well, what, are you, what were you actually thinking while you were up there? And I love this. He said, it's simple. I kept telling myself, stay calm and don't let go. Just stay calm and don't let go. It's amazing to me how well this story illustrates the text that we read from Habakkuk. It is a book written by a man whose name literally means hold on. That's what Habakkuk means. I'm not going to let go. And that's exactly how he lived his life. There's a backstory to these words that he's written. He was looking at the world and he was realizing that, you know, this is not exactly the way things are supposed to be. There was a civil war that had divided Israel into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had gotten dragged off into exile and slavery and it looked like the southern kingdom would end up facing the exact same faith. So he was broken hearted for his people. Habakkuk was a priest by trade, and to see his people given over to idolatry and political division, to see his people literally walking away from their faith was almost too much for him to handle. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? You and I live in an era where people are deeply politically divided, and we have allowed idolatry to work our way into our lives. And so here's Habakkuk. He's crying out, and he's begging God to restore his people and to revive their faith. And the reality was, that wasn't looking like it was gonna happen. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, he mentions all of these things that we read. He starts by talking about this agricultural disaster. To look out at the fields and to see that there are no crops, to, to see that there are grapevines, but they have no grapes on them. To take note that there are fig trees with no figs, to see olive trees with no olives to look out and see an empty pen that ought to be full of sheep and to gaze on barns that, barns that ought to be just packed with stall after stall after stall of cattle and to realize that there are no cattle out there. Now, let me translate that because it's important. The food from the ground represented the people of Israel's portfolio. And so what Habakkuk is actually talking about is it's like opening up your Bank America app to find that you're overdrawn in every account. It's like checks bouncing. I'm talking about assets being liquidated. I'm talking about whatever savings you've been able to scrap together being completely depleted. I'm talking about finding yourself in a situation where there are no more options, so you start cashing in your 401k. See, when Habakkuk says there are no grapes and there are no olives and there are no cattle, what he's actually asking is, what are we going to do now? Because the problem isn't that there's no toilet paper at Costco. The problem is there's no money to go to Costco and actually buy toilet paper. And so this situation for him is one that I bet some of us can relate to. I mean, for 10 months, we've been battling economic uncertainty. There's massive unemployment, almost 
A million people just this past week filed for unemployment for the first time. We've got a virus that is all around us. Many of us are facing difficulty. We've got stress, isolation, loneliness. And if we're honest, we're really, really sick of having to deal with this stuff. Like, we're tired of masks. We're tired of social distancing. We're tired of being dominated by a circumstance that's completely out of our control. And if that happens to be you, the question is, what do you do when you find yourself in a really dark day? What do you do in that moment? Well, the answer is, at least according to Habakkuk, is we choose to rejoice. We're gonna learn three things today about joy that I think are huge when it comes to following Jesus. And the first is, joy is a decision that you and I have to make. Make no mistake about it. Joy is not a feeling that just comes over you. Joy is not simply ha what, what happens when you wake up in a good mood. It's not a feeling of euphoria that somehow sweeps over you because a circumstance works out or a prayer gets answered exactly the way you want it to. Joy is not simply the feeling of being happy. See, I think what most of us have figured out already is that a feeling cannot sustain you in the dark times of life. I'm talking about experiencing joy like a slab on grade that can cause a house to be able to withstand a strong hurricane. That's the kind of joy that Habakkuk models. And just like you can decide to be angry, and make no mistake about it, only you control whether you're angry or not, right? Like those of us that are always angry, we're making a subconscious decision that we're gonna allow that anger to drive our lives. Anger is a choice. The decision of whether or not we're gonna see ourselves as a victim is a choice. Whether or not we're gonna decide to hang on to old, resent, old resentments. Joy is a decision. And it's a decision that we make even when there's no cattle and there's no olives and there's no money and I'm worried about my job and I don't know what the future's gonna bring and I'm concerned about my kids. See, it's then that joy actually matters. And here's what's cool. This is a decision that can actually be made in advance. See, I think a lot of power comes when you and I get to a place where, where we're able to preload a decision. You can't wait till it's too late. Think about it. If you're dating or you've got a kid who's dating, you should not wait to make a decision on your sexual boundaries until you're already out on the date, right? Like you gotta make that decision in advance. You got to predetermine what you are gonna do and what you are not gonna do. You cannot wait until you're in the throes of hormones and you've got his eyes and she smells good to make that decision. You can't wait until you're in front of the computer to decide what websites you are going to visit and are not gonna visit. In an era where all the porn sites are giving free admission, it's like their gift in a pandemic. You can't wait until the bottle is on the table and the ice is in the glass to decide whether or not you're gonna stay sober. So you cannot wait until you're in the middle of a temptation to make a decision. Well, Habakkuk is saying the same thing. Look at verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, get this, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Meaning, this is not happening right now. What he's saying is, this could happen one day, like, he's not looking out at the barn and seeing no cattle. There's still cattle there. The trees still have fruit on them. There's still money in the bank account. But what he's saying is, even if it gets worse, my choice would still be joy. He's preloading a decision to choose joy. Habakkuk is saying, I wish I would see revival for my people, but I'm not. I'm longing for this series of things to happen, but they're not actually happening. Great, I'm gonna choose joy anywhere. Oh, and if, if, even if things get worse, well, what kind of worse? No money, I'm still choosing joy. What, what about some kind of shortage? I'm still gonna choose joy. He's saying if X happens, then Y is what I'm gonna do. And for him, Y is the same thing that you and I need to do, and that is choose to rejoice. 
I choose joy. Joy is not an accidental feeling. It's an intentional decision to place your worship and your well-being into something that cannot be taken away from you. Here's what I've discovered. If you live long enough, life will take things away from you. And the reality is, which some of us know, life can take your car, it can take your job, it can wipe out your hobbies, it can affect your health, it can take away your money, your reputation, your success, you name it. Don't base your ultimate joy in something that can be taken away. That's Habakkuk. He's like, look, if, even if everything is taken away from me, God can never be taken away from me. And so my ultimate joy, my ultimate sense of well-being, the way I think about the future, it's not gonna be tied up in my current circumstance. It's not gonna be tied up in what somebody else is saying or somebody else's opinion. No, I'm gonna keep myself grounded in the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. So joy is a decision. But there's something deeper there. It also requires repetition. That's the second thing I see in this text. Joy is a decision that we make, but we've got to do it over and over again. See, Habakkuk, his decision wasn't made just once. It was made repeatedly. We see it in the text. In verse 18, he says, with all of this happening, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And here it is. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. You see that? It's over and over and over again. Why? Because repetition reveals importance. That's one of the reasons that there are four gospels instead of one. The story of Jesus and the culmination of God's offering redemption to humanity is so important and it's such a big deal that God didn't want just one telling. Now, Matthew's like, well, here's what I think happened in all of this deal, but you need to listen to Luke. And Luke's like, well, you need to check out what Mark said. And all of them were like, well, you need to go to John because John's gonna give you this really deep theological interpretation of the exact same events. These are four different accounts that essentially point to the same thing. It's getting those of us who are reading the text to understand that what we're reading now it is a really big deal. And so what we see in Habakkuk is, I'm going to make my decision, but I know my decision is enough for today, but it's not going to be enough for tomorrow. I'm going to need to make a decision again tomorrow, and then if I get it the day after that, I'm going to have to make that decision again, and it's, it's just again and again and again. And so it is with us. Listen, it's great that we trusted God when we got saved. It's good that God spoke to you maybe last weekend, but you gotta wake up and you gotta do it again tomorrow. Just like God's mercies are new every morning, like God's got a whole new batch of mercy baked fresh and waiting for us every single day, we've gotta decide that this day I'm gonna choose joy. And if I get to wake up tomorrow, well, tomorrow's first decision is I'm going to choose joy that day. And it just goes on and on and on. Well, Stephen, I don't like that. I get it. I completely understand. But if we're going to follow Jesus and if we're going to meet our goal, which is to walk closer with Jesus this year than we did last year, then we have got to learn to choose joy. Well, the world's not going the way I want it to. I understand that. Well, it just seems like everything in my life's a mess. I get it. But you still got to choose joy. And when you do that enough times, you become low maintenance in your faith. Listen, the enemy would love for all of us to have a fair-weathered faith. Fair-weather faith is where you and I live our lives needing God to constantly prove his love for us where we wake up and we're like, all right, God, well, what can you do for me today? Almost as if each day we're trying to build this case for why God should get our trust. That's basically what the devil thought Job was like. He says to God, Job doesn't really love you. He's just in it for what, he, what you can do for him. You let him down just one time and I guarantee you he'll walk away. And yet Job proved he wasn't just in it for the perks. He had a low maintenance faith. In fact, in Job chapter 13, he says, and though you slay me, yet I will hope in you. See, living your life this way, 
It brings a certain measure of peace because God doesn't have to act in a certain way. God doesn't have to answer every prayer exactly the way we think God should. God doesn't have to move every time you and I say jump in order for us to trust him. See, when we just say, I choose joy, I choose joy, I choose joy, it gets sewn into our muscle memory to the point where it doesn't matter what happens because we're not gonna base our joy on what's happening in the moment. In other words, circumstances can't change your joy because circumstances don't give you your joy. God gave you your joy. And that repetition is what leads us to a place of power. And more than power, y'all, it leads us to a place of peace. So you've gotta decide you're gonna choose joy. You've gotta repeat that decision every single day. And that leads to the third and final thing I see in this text, which is the contribution of joy. There's a contribution involved that comes to joy. In other words, joy is never selfish. And joy is never stingy. When you realize the joy of the Lord is your strength, your initial and swift reaction is to think about, well, who else in my life could use a dose of joy? See, that's what Habakkuk did. Theologians point out that the language he uses talking about harvest time and then the rejoice in the Lord pivot, it harkens back to the language he uses as a priest talking about first fruits. See, as a priest, Habakkuk knew all about first fruits. The people of God, when they had a crop, they were commanded to bring in the first fruits of that crop and give it to the storehouse. And that was put in place so there could be food in the house and there would be the ability to do the work of God and they could continue to participate in the benevolent ministry of sharing with other people. And so the language that he uses in this text suggests that he's saying, even in hard times, my mind is gonna be focused on a mentality that I'm gonna do what I can do with whatever resources God has given me to help fund God's kingdom. And even when I barely got enough to keep myself going, I'm still gonna be contributing generously to the work that God wants done. See, I think the same might be true for us. And make no mistake about it, sometimes that's gonna require an act of faith. That's why it's called first fruits. If you and I wait to the end of the month to see how much we have and then give 10%, there's no faith in that. All we're doing is giving God the leftovers. But when you make the decision that I'm gonna go from the very beginning and you give the first fruits, well, that takes a huge act of faith because that's scary. And that's hard, and that takes determination, and that right there is a show of commitment. But here's the deal. When you and I learn to approach our lives with open hands, we're actually able to contribute rather than hanging on so tightly. And that's not just the deal when it comes to our money. You can apply that to every aspect of your life. When you see your schedule and you approach that schedule with open hands, you find that you can make time for the people that matter most in your life. The same is true with energy. The same thing is true when it comes to loving other people. When you approach life with clenched fists and you feel like everybody around you is against you or everybody around you who doesn't think exactly the way you think is somehow different from you, then you end up not showing them love. I mean, Jesus made it clear, the greatest commandment is to love God with all of your strength, all of your energy, all of your time, all of your spirit, and then learn to love your neighbor. Love is unconditional. You don't have to agree with somebody to love them, but what you do have to do is approach every human being with open hands. Same thing's true when it comes to compassion. You may think there are people in your life because of what they've done, they don't deserve your compassion. You can approach them with clenched fists, but I promise you, if you approach broken people with open hands, you'd be amazed at what God can do through that. Same thing's true when it comes to showing and sharing grace 
or giving someone the benefit of the doubt or offering a second chance or quickly seeking forgiveness or getting involved and reaching out to make a difference through service. Y'all, I'm telling you, I know it feels like the world is falling apart right now, but for two weeks in a row, we've been given the answer that no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, no matter how bad it may feel at the moment, no matter how against the wall your back may feel, if you will make the decision that my life is gonna be grounded in something deeper than my circumstance, or deeper than my decision, or deeper than my failure. No, I'm going to stay grounded in joy. The simple fact that I make the decision that today I woke up, and the fact that my eyes opened, and I'm able to draw some measure of air into my lungs, and my legs work even if they hurt, I'm going to keep putting one foot in front of the other, and I'm going to choose joy, and I'm going to assume that this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice in it. That is an unbelievable way to live your life. And when you have that kind of joy day after day after day, and you can make that turn where what comes at you, your first instinct is not to cry out, well, why is all this bad stuff happening to me? But you make that pivot and you say, who do I think I am to assume that I shouldn't have bad stuff in my life? I promise you, over time, it changes how you look at life. It causes clenched fists to become open hands. And y'all, when you lay open hands at the foot of the cross of Jesus, it is staggering the change that he can bring. Make no mistake about it. The season that you and I are in is a bad season, but it's not gonna last forever. And the question that all of us have to ask is, I'm here, I can't do anything about it, so I'm gonna start looking around and am I gonna find the ways that God wants me to use me? And I promise you, if you let God use you, then you and I have got an opportunity to see the kingdom of God become a reality, not only in this world, but to continue to get seated in our souls. And I don't know about you, but I'd like a little bit more of that in my life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.